And uh, if I might ask Tony Godfrey from Boston University to join us here. Tony's done some very exciting work in uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma, and in particular is going to speak both to the application of the Thunderbolts cancer panel, as well as some hot off the press uh, results from digital PCR in terms of some of the specific mutation validation and follow-up. Great, thanks, Rupon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And yes, definitely hot off the press. My postdoc sent the data to me last night and I incorporated it this morning. So, so uh, as Rupon said, I'll talk to you today about uh, some of our work on esophageal adenocarcinoma. First, I'll start with just a little background on this disease, and I apologize for the next slide uh, while you're eating. But this is, if I have a pointer here somewhere, I, I can deal with a, a mouse maybe. Um, this is a typical uh, soft adenocarcinoma that's been resected from the patient. Uh, what you see up here is the tubular esophagus. This is the uh, stomach down here, and this is obviously the cancer, and this is typically where these tumors occur. They occur at the gastroesophageal junction. Um, interestingly, if you go back a few decades, just back to the 1950s, um, you never saw this tumor. And starting in the 1970s, the incidence started to increase. And over the last 30 or 40 years, the incidence has actually increased over 600%. And it's the rap most rapidly increasing tumor, solid tumor, um, in the United States. Along with that is a rapidly increasing mortality. It's a very deadly tumor. Um, average five-year survival is less than 15%. The uh, strongest risk factor for development of esophageal adenocarcinoma is gastroesophageal reflux disease. Again, I apologize for talking about this while you're eating. Um, gastroesophageal reflux leads to metaplasia and cancer. In the uh, normal setting, the lower esophagus is protected from the uh, acidic contents of the stomach by the lower esophageal sphincter. And if you look down uh, the esophagus into the, towards the stomach, as we're doing here, in a normal individual, what you see, uh, do, I, do, I, do I have a pointer? Which one is it? Oh, right, uh, the centerpiece? No. Yeah. Sorry, technologically challenged. Should be, I think, this one right here. Oh, got it. Center. Although I don't think it shows up on the screen. Okay, all right, we'll manage. We'll manage. Okay, that's fine. So, so what you're looking at here in this, uh, in this picture is looking down uh, towards the stomach. And you can see this, this epithelium here is the, the lighter epithelium is the uh, esophageal epithelium. And this is actually the stomach epithelium, or what we call the gastroesophageal junction here. But in a patient who has severe and chronic gastroesophageal reflux, the lower esophageal sphincter is incompetent. That allows the uh, gastric contents to reflux up into the esophagus. And when this happens, you get erosion and damage of the lower esophagus uh, epithelium. And what you see here in the, the sort of the pink tongues that are rising up from the stomach is what we call metaplasia or Barrett's esophagus, where the squamous epithelial lining is now being replaced by a columnar uh, epithelium. And this is the risk epithelium for development of esophageal adenocarcinoma, which you can see here. There are uh, millions of uh, adult, adult Americans at risk. Estimates are that anywhere from 6 to 20% of adult uh, Americans have gastroesophageal reflux. Estimates, again, are 2 to 3 million Americans with this metaplasia, bar Barrett's esophagus, and that imparts a 5 to 10% lifetime risk of progressing to cancer. There are many opportunities for molecular tools to help in the management of these patients. Uh, I'm going to focus today on two of those that my lab is, is, is working on currently. The first is, um, unfortunately, 50% of patients who develop esophageal adenocarcinoma are diagnosed already with metastatic disease. At this point, they have a survival expectation of less than 5% at five years. This is in a setting where we have a high-risk population, the patients who have Barrett's esophagus, that provides an ideal group for screening. You know, it's two to three million people, uh, and we know who they are for the most part. So this is one area that we could address. Another area, very different, is that the patients who are diagnosed with earlier stages uh, disease, stages one through three, frequently undergo neoadjuvant therapy prior to surgery. So this would be chemotherapy or chemotherapy plus radiation. The goal being to sort of minimize the disease before surgery. 
Unfortunately, only 40 to 50 percent of the patients actually respond to therapy, and even worse, 10 to 20 percent of the patients progress while on therapy. And for a lot of them, what that means is that while they may have been surgically treatable to start with, uh, after eight to 10 weeks of uh, chemotherapy and radiation, they are no longer surgical candidates. And at that point, unfortunately, their outcomes again are very, very bad. So the way that my lab is approaching uh, these two challenges is to look at circulating cell-free tumor DNA, the so-called liquid biopsy. I took this figure from a recent paper from the Hopkins group. And uh, the theory of this, of course, is that as the tumor grows, it sheds DNA. That DNA gets into uh, the, the circulation, into the plasma. And you can use this for early detection and monitoring, theoretically. Uh, you can also use it to, uh, you, to determine the right directed targeted therapy, if you can identify the mutations that are present in the tumor by, taking, uh, by analyzing the circulating tumor DNA. You can monitor response to therapy, uh, and you can actually watch the uh, tumor mutations, the clonality of the tumor change uh, in response to selective pressure from, from therapeutics. So far, uh, there's very limited data on esophageal adenocarcinoma. This, again, is data from, from the recent Hopkins paper in 2014. Uh, they looked at a set of 21 patients with gastroesophageal cancer. So this is actually a mixed bag. This is three different tumor types. It's esophageal adenocarcinoma, it's stomach cancer, gastric cancer, and it's also uh, esophageal squamous cancer, which is a very different disease. And again, only 21 patients. The good news, however, is that in the seven patients that have metastatic disease, as shown here on the left, and you see these guys right here, 100% uh, of them had detectable circulating tumor DNA in, in the plasma. The amounts were not as high as for some of the other tumor types. You can see on the graph on the right there, I've again highlighted the gastroesophageal group uh, with the red oval. Uh, but typically, there were between 10 and 100 copies of tumor DNA per mil of plasma. When they looked at the earlier stage patients, uh, there were only 14, but approximately 60% of the earlier stage patients had detectable circulating tumor DNA, again, so that's pretty good, and again, 100% of the metastatic patients. So this is promising, and we, we're hopeful that we can, can build on this and use this. So as we come back to our two questions, the way, oops, the way we, uh, what we hope to do to address these questions is, Number one, we need to determine the feasibility of using circulating tumor DNA as a potential cancer detection tool in patients with uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma. And to, uh, to, to determine the feasibility of that, we need to look at a large number of patients with various stages. In particular, we need to look at patients with early stages. So that's what we're building up to. And then when we come to looking at the uh, new adjuvant therapy question, we need to determine if the circulating tumor DNA quantity uh, changes during the course of therapy. What we'll be looking for in this regard is as a patient undergoes the first rounds of chemotherapy and radiation, uh, does the tumor marker drop in their plasma? Uh, that's been seen for ovarian cancer and for breast cancer already. And I wouldn't be here today if we weren't using the Raindance platforms. Okay. So our group um, recently published uh, a paper in Nature Genetics on whole exome sequencing of 150 esophageal adeno specimens. This was in, in collaboration with our colleagues at Dana-Farber. But as we move forward with this, we, uh, we need a, a targeted sequencing platform that we can use to verify the, the data that we already have from the exomes, but also for analysis of new tumors, because one of the things that you need when you start moving into the, into the plasma circulating, circulating uh, tumor DNA realm is you need larger volumes of plasma than, than you're typically using. So uh, just for example, as we prospectively collect samples now, we're collecting two tubes of, of blood from patients, giving us sort of eight to 10 mils of plasma. Um, and we don't have that on our retrospectively banked specimen. So we need a, a new tool, because exome sequencing is obviously too expensive. When we first conceived the project, we planned to use the AmpliSeq technology, not necessarily the cancer hotspot panel, but certainly the AmpliSeq technology and PGM sequencing. But then when we bought the uh, Raindrop system for digital PCR, Darren uh, Link at Raindrop, uh, Raindance uh, mentioned the Thunderbolts panel, and we thought it would be a kind of a good idea uh, up front to test them head to head. So that's what we did. Uh, initially, we did eight samples with each. These were tumor samples, not plasma samples. 
Uh, all of the library construction was performed in-house by my postdoc, uh, Jennifer Jackson, who uh, has been working her tail off to present this, to get this data for me to present. And uh, the libraries, as I said, were, were made in-house, but then we sent out the, uh, the samples for sequencing to outside sequencing facilities. You've seen this several times already tonight, so I'm not going to harp on this. Um, you get great coverage and you get good uniformity, even though this was uh, the, the beta panel. And I just highlighted here with the red arrows, two, two cases. We used um, four tumors, either 100 nanograms or 10 nanograms. And the two 10 nanogram samples, you can still see that you're up in the 92-93% uh, uniformity of 0.2x of the mean coverage. So again, very good coverage, even with the beta panel. We also compared the um, allele fre minor allele frequencies with Thunderbolts versus AmpliSeq, and great correlation. This is just an IGV snapshot of one of them. This is a KRAS G12V mutation. I uh, call it 46% in AmpliSeq and 47% in uh, the Thunderbolts. But, uh, and I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a, a next gen sequencing expert, and my lab doesn't have a ton of experience with this, so I'll be interested to see what the, the, the audience thinks. But our experience with this is that the, ampli that the um, Illumina data is a lot cleaner. Uh, than the PGM data, so, so we're quite happy with this. You can see that in the top panel here. I think you can see all of these sort of missed calls that come out of the, uh, the PGM sequencer that, and, the, and the Illumina data, at least to us, looks to be a lot cleaner. The last thing we did to, to evaluate the, the Thunderbolts was to look at concordance from run to run. So this is now two independent library construction uh, processes and two independent runs uh, on the uh, MySeq. And again, you can see you get a high concordance for the uh, minor allele frequency. So in our hands, if we compare Thunderbolts versus AmpliSeq, um, you know, both of them in our hands work with 10 nanograms uh, of DNA, um, compared with, I think, the minimum for TrueSeq is something like 150 or maybe even more. But the, probably the most important thing is that um, uh, Jen, my postdoc, said that the Thunderbolts workflow is really much, much, much simpler than the AmpliSeq. I, I would echo what Andy told us earlier, we didn't take three months to get our first data off the AmpliSeq, but it, it took us a good month. Um, and we had quite a lot of problems uh, getting, it, getting it to work first time versus Thunderbolts, which worked literally first time for us. Uh, it was very simple. There are fewer steps. Um, Jen likes the fact that there are less washes, less chance to lose the products, as she said. Um, and again, the fact that y once you've made the library, you're ready to go straight on the sequencer as opposed to all the quantification that you have to do and the one touch that you have to do for the, uh, for the uh, AmpliSeq protocol. And again, I've already mentioned, uh, we like the fact that the Thunderbolt is designed to give us data from the Illumina sequencers. I think that um, certainly based on uh, PGM sequencing, I don't know about with proton sequencing, but certainly based on PGM sequencing, uh, I think we're going to get see a significantly lower cost per sample and that will help us, of course, being an academic lab and dependent on NIH funding. So that's it for the Thunderbolts. The next thing that we wanted to do was to verify uh, these mutations and to literally to actually to gain experience with the digital PCR platform. So we selected 10 of the tumors that we had sequencing data on. Um, some of it was just exome data. And we picked six unique mutations in three genes, P53, KRAS, and SMAD4. And you can see the mutations that we selected here. For P53, it was a single uh, uh, mutation in four samples. We had three separate KRAS mutations. And then we had two uh, different mutations at the same location in the SMAD4 gene. We don't have a lot of experience designing digital PCR assays. I don't think anyone does. So for this first set, we decided to uh, take advantage of a service from IDT where you can send them the sequence and they'll design your primers and probes for you. Uh, specifically, they use these new probes called Zen probes. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with those, the double quenched probes. We labeled the wild type with TET, the mutant with FAM. And theoretically, at least, as you can see in the right panel here, uh, the fact that these double quench Zen probes have two quenchers in there and that the internal quencher is closer to the floor for is supposed to give you lower background. And this is um, the, the, the spec sheets from uh, IDT. You see the low background. These are regular, regularly labeled probes. This is the Zen probe set. We didn't see that with our probes when we ran them. These are our, um, and I apologize, you probably can't see that. At the, can, can you even see that at the back? Okay. Um, 
these are our wild type probes. So three of them looked okay, very much like the published data. Uh, this one's terrible, high background, very little signal. And these ones, low background, but still very little signal. And it was even worse when we went to the mutant probes. Only one of them looked good. Um, so s literally these probes came in a couple of weeks ago. Um, we are going back to IDT to, to see what they think of them. But even though they look pretty bad, the digital PCR data didn't look so bad. Five of the six assays that we, uh, that we got from IDT actually gave acceptable data, acceptable data in the first run using just standard conditions that, uh, that we were given from, from Raindance for these assays. Uh, this is one of them. This is the P53 assay. In the left panel, you're looking at no template control, so reasonably clean. A little bit of spray out on the, on, on the x-axis. In the next panel in the middle, we have the, just the wild type P53 control. You can see the nice positive group and relatively clean. A few positive uh, droplets in, in the, in the uh, positive gate. And on the right, we have the tumor that was 23% uh, minor allele frequency. This is two more assays. Uh, top panel is SMAD, SMAD4, one of those. Again, uh, no template control, wild type control in the middle, and the positive tumor and then the KRAS G12V. So again, first run, no optimization, just standard conditions, doesn't look too bad. The last one I'm gonna show you is, is the KRAS G12R mutant. And in this case, we did a quick, this was one of the better looking ones. So we did a quick dilution just to see what the sensitivity might be. We have the wild type only up here, just a, a couple of false positives in the positive gate. And then we go from 50% down, 10, 5, 1, and maybe, maybe even as low as 0.5%, although I would say that uh, I would be comfortable calling 1% with this assay. And again, uh, at this point, no major optimization uh, attempted. So uh, overall, um, first of all, all of, the, all of the mutations in the tumors were verified, as you would expect, given the fact that we had sequencing data from at least two platforms on all of these. And as a, the other presenters have already mentioned, the um, uh, allele frequencies with the digital PCR versus the sequencing platforms were highly concordant. So finally, we, uh, finally, as in again, yesterday, we um, looked at five plasma samples that we had, or these are actually serum samples that we had available from uh, the cancer patients. We looked at uh, four for w who had the uh, P53 mutation. What you're looking at here again is the no template control. There are three positives in, in the positive gate. The wild type, in this case, unfortunately, was a little bit more noisy. We had 11 positives in, 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 the, in the positive gate. And then on, on the right side in the top panel is the actual uh, tumor sample where we had, uh, I, I believe that was somewhere around 40 or 50% um, mutant frequency. In the bottom panel, we're looking at the four serum samples from the patients who had this mutation. And on the left, patient 310, uh, we saw 14 in the positive gate. Uh, questionable whether that's positive or not. Uh, 315 had three. The one on the end, 1102, had five. And then uh, this guy here is the one that we're kind of interested in, uh, had 19 positives. But uh, I'd be interested to see who, who, who here would call that. I, I wouldn't. I'm not, I wouldn't call that positive. I would say that's interesting, but the assay needs to be cleaned up a lot before we, can, before we could go anywhere with that. And this, I think, really illustrates one of the problems that we're having right now with this, is that this spray on the x-axis is causing a little bit of a problem for calling uh, very rare variants. This one's a little bit better, though. This is a KRAS G12S. Uh, again, top left, no template control. In this case, very, very clean. Uh, the wild type, again, very clean. The tumor, as you'd expect. And in this case, we've got eight, eight positive droplets in, in the positive gate. And this one I'd be more comfortable with. I obviously want to see replicates, but for now we're saving the precious uh, serum DNA that we have until we've cleaned up the assay some. Um, but we're hopeful that this one will actually uh, end up being real. Just for uh, your information, that's a 0.04% allele frequency that we're looking at, if that's true. 
up until this point, we hadn't looked at the actual patient data for these samples. We literally looked at the exome data. We identified mutations in, tumor, in genes that were in the hotspot panel. We selected those tumors. We then applied the AmpliSeq or the Thunderbolts to them. And then from there, as you've seen, we went through and designed assays based on uh, which assays looked best on our first runs. So when we went back and, and looked at the uh, staging of these patients, um, we probably could have done ourselves some more favors if we had picked some later stage. All of these patients are stage uh, two or less, and three of them are stage one. So it's maybe not surprising that we're not seeing a whole lot of uh, circulating tumor DNA in, in these first five cases. Uh, but I'm encouraged that we might have one positive, and, and the P53 we'll have, to, uh, we'll have to follow up on. So in summary, um, in our hands, Thunderbolt is a great tool for mutation detection with uh, low DNA input. We intend to be using it going forward. I think it's safe to say that digital PCR can easily verify mutations with 1% uh, allele frequency or greater, even with minimal optimization of, of, the, uh, of the assays. I think that detection of allele frequencies lower than that is going to require optimization. And specifically, we're going to need to identify what the source of the background spray is uh, and to overcome that. Um, having said that, I do think that detection of these lower allele frequencies will be easier if we can put more DNA in. We started, as I said, with two to three mi uh, mils of, of serum, and we only used a fraction of that in these assays. But what we've observed so far is that the background doesn't seem to increase with the increasing amount of target. So if that holds true, then the more you put in, you should be able to see that positive uh, cluster come out above the background uh, uh, in the future. And of course, what that really leads to is, is I think the field needs a statistical approach for calling these rare mutations. We can't be standing up here saying, oh, what do you think? Is that real or not? We have to come up with a better way of doing that. I really need to acknowledge Jennifer Jackson, my postdoc, who has quite literally, for the last two weeks, hardly left the lab to try and generate this data, and Anders Stahlberg, Stahlberg who is a visiting professor in my lab right now. The samples that we uh, ran here were collected by my longtime colleagues, Jim Lukasic and Arjun Panather at Pittsburgh, um, and our histo tech out there who cuts all the samples and ships, all, ships them all to, this, to us whenever we need them. And of course, I have to thank um, Raindance, in particular Darren and Michael for your help, and the indispensable Corey, who without whom I don't think we'd have any of the assays working yet. So that's great. Okay, thanks. Yeah, once we, once we have um, the assays set and once we have the uh, early stage cancer patient data, one of the nice things about our Pittsburgh colleagues cohort is that they do a lot of surgeries on patients with benign esophageal disease and we have all of those samples banked. So, but we're waiting until we have the assays optimized before we think about that. And is there any reason you're using serum as opposed to plasma or is that just the serum type you have? That's the sample type we have for these patients. These uh, collections go back to 1999, and um, at the time we were doing a single red top tube uh, collection, uh, single spin, so they were suboptimal for the kind of work that we're trying to do. But um, we decided to give it a shot because you know, the only real sort of downside to serum samples is that the potential for having some leftover white blood cells in there, giving you background DNA or that some of the white blood cells could be ruptured and release the DNA uh, during clotting. And you know, one of the advantages of the raindrop system with 10 million droplets is that we can take hundreds of nanograms of DNA. So if there's more background, that's okay. It, what we actually saw was that we still only got about 10 to 30 nanograms per mil. So we're right in the range of what people were expecting to see from plasma. But going forward, we are definitely doing two tubes of EDTA and um, plasma preparation protocols. So the, the graph at the beginning about secreted uh, relatively low compared to some other tumor types. Yeah. Was that from late stage? That was the uh, metastatic patients. That was the seven metastatic patients. Is there anything you can say about? Uh, 
um, the only data I'm aware of is the stuff that I just showed. Yeah, so um, it, it's on the low end, but still, as I said, it's 10 to 100 copies per mil. So it should be detectable. We should, we should be able to see it. Frazier, I think you have a question. Yeah, Tony, from the cytology side of things, I mean, with uh, fine needles or exfoliative cytology, particularly with the fine needles of deep sites or types of scraping and softness, for example, can we turn backward flips to try to make cell blocks in order to put things through form and fixation and, and so we can uh, dissect? And yet, often on the direct smears, alcohol fixed, we see, you know, we see clusters of tumor cells that can be microvasected. Do you think that this technology would have a, a potential advantage for that sort of very small, focused, and rich sample on, on an alcohol fixed smear? An advantage over something uh, like making, trying to make cell blocks in order to view tumor cellularity. And yeah. Tissues. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if you, obviously, if you can, if you can detect one percent or less, if you have that, then why bother to go to the hassle of enriching and trying to do do those other steps? I think that'd be a, a clear application. Not sure where you're using cytology for esophageal samples, but you're doing the cytosponge. Yeah. No, not so much for esophageal. I, I was thinking, you know, in the brushing setting, uh, yeah. you could do that. But usually, there's a good enrichment. But particularly when the radiologists go to deep, you know, para aortic nodes and things like that. Uh -huh. oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. E bus. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a high failure rate when we try to take the sample. We put it in 50 mLs of RPMI. We spin it down. The lowest paid person in the department tries to pick out little fragments from the bottom. And then the second lowest paid member in the department takes it out and, uh, and puts it into the wax the next uh -huh. day. And we're often disappointed. Well, I would suggest rather than investing $125,000 in instrumentation, pay your people some more. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thanks.